Hello, and welcome to the HRD Live podcast. This week, I was honoured to be joined by Michael Fricaro, CHRO of MasterCard. Michael joined me by a studio uplink from the USA to discuss MasterCard's passion for workplace culture, the journey of talent through their organisation, the future of leadership, and more. It was a really fascinating discussion. Michael's really passionate about transforming the world of work, and I think you're going to really enjoy it. Michael, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Michael. So, first of all... Um, What role does MasterCard's workplace culture then play in transforming the employee experience? So if I start with the the macro, we have a a corporate priority that uh, we are driving this winning culture with decency at its core. And so the workplace culture is fundamental in looking at how our employees um, experience the day-to-day activities uh, either with their colleagues, co-workers, uh, their managers, um, and essentially all of the experiences they have are around this company culture that we have with this decency component um, at its core. And, and what I really want to talk about around this decency, we look at a number of elements around people that come to work because of their uh, background and experience, what they've achieved, uh, their successes, how they relate to one another. Um, But this decency at its core is a really fundamental component of the employee experience. And so when we think about it from, let's say, an example of um, career development, we want employees to have a really honest conversation with their manager or their supervisor to talk about, you know, what are their strengths, what are the development areas, and how we're going to help support them in terms of some specific development actions. So for example, if someone um, is aspiring to become a senior executive in this organization, and part of their development is around um, public speaking, uh, that's their area of, uh, of development, then working together with their manager, they have to find what are the kinds of opportunities or experiences that will help them develop that particular skill set. So that's sort of one way of being very fair and transparent with the individual, but helping them in terms of their career journey in the organization. So that's that's one particular example. I think the other one is also being realistic uh, with an individual around uh, that they may not be great in um, in everything that they believe. So also calling out things in a realistic way rather than shying away from difficult or challenging conversations. That's how we roll it up into this employee experience and this decency in the organization. Wonderful. I really like that idea of decency, actually. And again, I think it makes such a difference to how you feel about your organization as well, having that, as you say, that transparency in your relationship with them. But t- talking about the, 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 the journey of that individual, then, what is the journey of talent like in, in joining MasterCard? How does that how does that look? Yeah, so someone joining the organization, I mean, I can tell you a real story. Just, um, just recently, last week, uh, we kicked off our new graduate uh, development program, which we've actually branded as MasterCard Launch. Um, And so, and we came up with the idea of MasterCard Launch is because we're really launching the career of these uh, these individuals. Now, historically, our campus recruitment programs, uh, even up until last year, 2018, we would have about 150 uh, graduates coming and joining our, our campus program um, this year, as an example, we've grown that to about 460 uh, graduates that have come to join our organization. So last week, we essentially had this MasterCard launch program here in New York that covered graduates from uh, the North America region, Latin America, and Europe. So 260 of the individuals were here. And one of the first steps of the whole uh ways of a individual coming and joining the organization is an onboarding exercise, um, ensuring that individuals have the right tools, they've got a buddy, they have connections with their manager. So all of those fundamentals are, are there. In fact, we also send out a gift uh, to all employees in the organization that are joining uh, the organization. So that's sort of one thing to get them started and to feel a sense of belonging. Because again, it goes back to the question around uh, the kind of culture 
uh, that we have in the organization. Uh, and so that sense of belonging is really, really important on, uh, on that early stage of, uh, of joining. The MasterCard launch program is really a, uh, a showcase, if you will, of a three-day boot camp that these uh, individuals would go through and they get a huge level of uh, exposure around the company strategy, our values, our culture. Um, and equally last week in the launch program, we give them a, a insight into other elements of MasterCard's culture. So one area is around the work that we do with public and private partnerships. So we had um, an experience last week where they got to hear the stories of the work that we do with, uh, with refugees around the world. And they went through that whole experience and journey around what it's like to be a, a refugee and what is some of the work that MasterCard does in terms of things like providing data to uh, NGOs or providing solutions that the NGOs may need to help some of these displaced people around the world. And it just gives the individuals that are joining the organization not just what they need to learn to actually do their job, but also the broader aspects uh, that they're coming into an organization that really lives the culture, has a clear purpose in society. And that's extremely powerful for our employees. Fantastic. And on those those broader aspects and those 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 wider things that can change how um, an organization works and the employees role uh, within it. What about technology then in that case? How have you found that technology has, has reshaped or is reshaping the employee experience within MasterCard? Yeah, I mean, you know, we are a we are a tech company. Again, I, I will share uh, a story. Um, a few years ago, we ran an employee uh, engagement survey. And one of the uh, pieces of feedback was around um, the tools to be able to do my job effectively. And so the feedback was uh, from some of the, um, the sales teams that we had grown exponentially as a, as a company. Um, and the tools that the sales force had when they go out to visit customers, quite often the, um, the battery uh, wouldn't charge or the, the machine that they had, the laptop uh, was old and clunky. And so we used that feedback to basically change our replenishment um, cycle. So instead of changing a laptop every four years, we changed it every two years. And we actually gave employees choice so they could choose from three different options of machines or, or laptops uh, that we had. And that, that whole sense of if we are a technology company, giving our employees the tools to operate like a technology is extremely important. And it goes, again, to um, the culture of, uh, of the company as well. Um, so that's sort of one example. The other one is obviously uh, using technology to actually enable productivity uh, is another another way. So we've invested over the last few years to provide uh, tools like digital sales aids so that when the sales force are out on the road uh, visiting clients, they can actually pull down presentations or proposals that will help them on uh, knowledge around a particular product, but it's done in real time. And then there's other tools as well that enable collaboration. So things like a, a team site that we are piloting um, is another way, or the use of video to do conferencing. So there's a whole range of different tools like that, as well as things like uh, online real-time uh, learning. So there's a whole range of, uh, of tools that we're doing in technology. The most recent one that I'm excited to talk about is we've, uh, we've just launched um, what's called Connected Classrooms. So this is another way and, and infrastructure and technology that enables us to conduct virtual learning, either using uh, virtual reality or um, connected classrooms where we would have uh, employees sitting in our St. Louis office, employees sitting in our Pune office, and maybe some people sitting in a Sydney office and actually sharing a learning experience in this environment, which is very much uh, tech enabled. So that's really um, a, a clever way of actually ensuring that we're reinforcing this lifelong learning concept. 
And then the final uh, area where we're using technology actually is using artificial intelligence. So I shared earlier a little bit about career development conversations. This year, we actually launched um, these career development cards for every one of the 16,000 employees that we have. We then used our artificial intelligence uh, garage, we call it the AI garage, to help us use the, um, the tool to pull out what are the common uh, development themes or what are the common strengths that we see in the organization to actually help us build more robust training needs analysis so that it will help us inform the kind of investment we need to make in training. So there's a whole range of different tools that we're using either proprietary to the HR function or uh, using the tools that are already available in other parts of the business. Amazing. There's so many different initiatives, it seems, and, and things being planned. This plethora of different um, HR initiatives being launched. It's fantastic. But it's so on, on a separate note, slightly, there's a lot of talk right now about um, purpose in organizations and how workers today are generally looking for more purpose in their organizations than simply providing them with a place to work. Um, how is How are you and how is MasterCard helping employees to feel more engaged um, in the organization? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and in fact, I can again speak from personal experience around this whole concept of purpose. I mean, uh, one of the partnerships that we have, we've got several, but one of them is the, the World Food Program, um, and uh, we had set out a fairly audacious goal a few years ago of providing a hundred million uh, school meals in uh, developing markets. And the reason behind that was we actually saw a correlation between uh, providing a meal to children in developing uh, uh, countries and education. So if you can attract individuals, young kids to go to school to get a meal, it is more likely they'll stay at school to actually be educated. So that was the the concept. And we've achieved uh, that goal. But part of the... um, the relationship that we have with the World Food Program is we actually are able to send uh, our employees out on a mission. Um, And the idea of this mission is for four weeks, these individuals would work with uh, members of the World Food Program, United Nations, um, and actually do cost-benefit analysis and actually look at enlisting other schools in those particular communities to actually sign up to the World Food Program. And the ecosystem's quite unique. So you'll have a school at the center, uh, you'll have farmers that are close by, you'll have the local government. And as long as that ecosystem is fluid, um, it actually will work, right? So so that's the concept. And our employees get tremendous uh, experience of actually spending time in a different market. Uh, they learn a new culture, they get an opportunity to develop their analytical skills. And then at the end of the four weeks, they have to present their recommendations and proposal back to the local government. So last year, I actually visited uh, Ghana and spent a week there and experiencing it firsthand, the work that our teams are doing. So this is something that um, we don't just talk about, we do. So that's sort of one example. Um, We have also uh, set up a center for inclusive growth, um, and we have we've basically got um, a significant amount of money set aside, $500 million, in fact, to invest over the next five years to really reverse the cycle of poverty and advance inclusive growth around different markets around the world. So I have set up a team in uh, my HR function, which is basically called Talent Enablement and Community Engagement. That's the name of the function. I've got couple of people in my team that work with our Center for Inclusive Growth. And we're, we're basically now looking to launch a partnership where we're being even more deliberate in actually accessing all these different partnerships that we have and connecting it with the development of talent within the organization. And again, it goes back to not just doing it for the sake of doing it and ticking a box, but actually part of it is around this work that we have and this this passion that we have for uh, making a better world and better communities, but also helping in the development of future leaders in this organization. Because we do fundamentally believe 
that the leaders of the future will actually need to have um, an, an awareness and a consciousness about social and global issues around the world and what better way of doing it than actually partnering it with, uh, with some of these organizations that we have relationships with already. You said a couple of really interesting things there. One of them was about not just saying, but doing and, and, and showing that you're doing that, but also about the future leaders of tomorrow. And I think it's really important that, you know, leadership is a huge, a huge part of that, right? About you're not just saying, but doing and demonstrating. On that note, what do you think the future of leadership looks like in, in business, in organizations? Yes. So there's a couple of things really here about the future of leadership. I mean, one of them is um, the world is constantly changing. Um, and I think the role of leaders is in, in this future is to be aware of all of these macro trends that are happening, whether it's uh, technological change, uh, geopolitical change, um, social change that's happening, generational change. There's a whole range of different factors that leaders need to be in tune with and aware of uh, because the way that employees are coming in, they're extremely diverse. They come from different family backgrounds, economic backgrounds and so forth. And so that understanding of how complex the world is, the leaders of the future have to be able to almost demystify and make sure that the the place that people come to work is a safe place and it's a place where individuals can bring their whole self. So I think that's one one critical aspect of leadership of the future. I would say the second one, uh, the other key driver that I that I see, uh, which is really important, is this aspect of um, uh, of coaching and and skilling and helping develop uh, individuals within their team. So it's almost the role of a leader is uh, is being a a teacher in many ways. Um, and so I talked earlier about, you know, collected classrooms and so forth. If you think about the scale of change that's happening, um, and there's obviously a range of, of, you know, automation, artificial intelligence, particularly that are coming in to uh, take certain activities away from individuals. The only way that individuals in the organizations are going to remain relevant is by continually learning. And it's not just going to be learning in the formal sense of a classroom. It's going to be those individual moments that a leader or a supervisor observes of, uh, of their employee actually doing something and providing them real-time uh, feedback and coaching. And I think that's an important part of, of what we see of leadership of, in the future. That's going to be a critical skill, this coaching and, and developing uh, the next generation. Michael, if you could give one top tip to a, a business leader, a people leader who wants to create a cultural change in their organization but just has no idea where to start, what would you tell them? I would say start with what is the what's the what what are you trying to achieve? You know, what is what's working and what is it that you believe you need to um, to shift and you know, there's a lot of conversations at the moment that gets played out in the media around poor behavior. Uh, but then there's other organizations that are looking to sustain a high performance culture. So I think you really have to diagnose what you're trying to, um, to shift here. The other, the other comment I would say is that quite often, um, in most cases, culture transformation actually conjures up a whole lot of fear in individuals rather than this concept around uh, renovating. Um, and it's almost like this, uh, you know, you've got a house um, and the, the foundations are strong and solid. And most companies, uh, I would say, have got strong, solid foundations and histories. But you need to continually to, to tweak. You know, you may want to upgrade the kitchen. You may want to upgrade the bathroom. <laughs> and it's a bit like that in organizations. And I think you, you have to continually monitor and work at, um, at cultural evolution or renovation, if you will. And I think that's an important piece to, um, to look at when you're looking at, at culture. Fantastic. And another thing, where do, you, where do you think that a lot of, or maybe where do business leaders go wrong, do you think, when they're trying to create a cultural change? What's the, what's the mistake you think that many business leaders might make? Yes, quite often the uh, the way culture change happens in organisations, it becomes a little 
of a gimmick. You know, we're going to put out a new set of uh, value statements. We're going to put out a new vision, uh, you know, and it becomes almost orchestrated through a, a marketing and a sales campaign versus right. going a level deeper and sort of saying what fundamentally is going on in this organization and what are the behaviors that we need to shift. And I think the focus needs to lean more on uh, behavioral shift and behavioral change um, versus just, uh, you know, going out there with putting out new um, new placards of, of what your culture and, and vision is going to be. Um, so I think that's, that's where I see a lot of it uh, going wrong. I think it becomes a very tactical exercise, a tick the box. And culture, as we know, is not a tick the box exercise. It's very deep um, and ingrained in the way that every system of your organization, whether it's your performance management system, your learning systems, your reward systems, uh, your recruitment and selection, I mean, there are so many fundamental components. And if they're not aligned, uh, then it, regardless of what kind of cultural shift you're trying to change, it's not going to work. And I think that's an important part of, of culture. It's a systemic change that needs to be uh, at the top of the, uh, of the agenda. A truly inspiring note to end on. Michael, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. And I really look forward to seeing you on here again soon. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for listening to this episode of the HRD Live podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, you can visit hrdconnect.com for more or subscribe via iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.